Okay, so uh, my name is Jason Jung. Uh, currently, I'm an ASU PhD student, uh, formerly at Emory uh, with all of you guys. And then actually, even before that, I was also at Georgia Tech, so I kind of went through all of the institutions, I guess. Um, uh, <clears throat> so uh, I'm currently a third year PhD student with Iman. I'm sure a lot of you guys know. And a lot of my work is in kind of uh, GANs and applications of GANs because I feel like a lot of the big problems, at least in the medical setting, and especially in like other settings as well, is kind of a lack of data in a sense. <clears throat> I mean, everybody says big data, big data, but I don't know about you guys, but it, you know, trying to clean up data, get you know good data, and then training on those data, and all these like DICOM manipulations and processing and all that stuff is very difficult and time consuming for sure. So, <clears throat> and uh, I'm sure, uh, I guess some of you, maybe even Zach knows that um, <clears throat> uh, there's also a lot of like security risks involved with sharing data as well, because you know some data sets might not be as big. Um, so uh, I guess my talk is kind of, I've, I have 79 slides, so uh, I'll skip uh, things if we need to, but um, a lot of it is just kind of a general overview of GANs at first, and then after that, I'll kind of go over uh, some specific or I guess interesting applications of GANs that I've seen in medical imaging, <clears throat> and then kind of the work that I've done in uh, medical imaging as well applications. And then finally, hopefully get through like kind of what I think is like the difficulties of GANs and maybe um, some future directions that we could go towards. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, I do not have the Emory access to the book. So this is going to be kind of off the cuff. Uh, so bear with me on that one. But OK. <clears throat> OK, so. Uh, I guess to formally announce it, uh, it's really kind of the applications of uh, GANs or generative adversarial networks in medical image synthesis. Um, and a lot of it is kind of translation and augmentation, but in general, GANs can also be used for like super resolution or um, <clears throat> I guess denoising. But I guess I think the more interesting parts are kind of translation and the augmentation aspects. So this is kind of what I just said about the overview. I'll, I'll just talk about GANs a little bit. <clears throat> talk about the applications of GANs in medical imaging, especially talk about my recent works and I kind of talk about um, what are the difficulties in maybe training or um, getting, you know, relatively interesting GANs in a sense. <clears throat> so let's say a brief review. Uh, so what's a GAN, right? Um, <clears throat> everybody's heard of like sort of like deep fakes or like um, synthetic images and stuff like that. And it's actually like fairly new. Um, it started in 2014, and it's really <coughs> not even an architecture, I want to say. It's a more of a framework of um, deep learning models in which there is a generator and discriminator, and they're kind of competing against each other uh, to kind of, uh, best each other, right? Um, the generator wants to <coughs> generate realistic images. The discriminator wants to see if this image is real or fake. And even with this like very simple concept of, you know, um, <clears throat> one party trying to make a realistic image and another party trying to figure out if it's real or fake, uh, through the iterative learning, like you could really get really good generators out of this. Um, obviously, classic examples are the MNIST data set. So, <clears throat> you know, within, I would say, if you have GPU access, you can probably take like two minutes to if you just copy paste the architecture and then let it run, you could, you know, again, in a few minutes, get a generator that can generate for you <clears throat> any of these like MNIST, like one, two, three, four, any of the number of generations. So that's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> in most cases, um, the generator and discriminator are similar networks. So in a sense, you want them to be competing against each other on a fair level. So if the generator is way stronger than the discriminator, <clears throat> you'll just have a lot of images that are just generated. But it won't be quote unquote realistic because the discriminator that's supposed to guide it towards realism isn't strong enough. Vi uh, vice versa, if the discriminator is too strong, then the generator really can't learn anything 
uh, there's no, I guess, positive feedback in a sense. <clears throat> so <clears throat> for the most part, you would just get like random noise, uh, maybe even some other mode collapse or vanishing gradients. Um, <clears throat> and this generator is a unsupervised approach. Um, <clears throat> in the original, like 2014 paper, they use uh, like MLE or they referenced <clears throat> MLE or Markov chain methods of generating synthetic images. But they show that even this, you know, simple quote unquote architecture <clears throat> outperforms all of these uh, methods. So <clears throat> they, I guess like the two big problems in GANs, or at least in training GANs, is to avoid mode collapse and vanishing gradients. Um, <clears throat> So ideally, the GANs will generate something in the realistic distribution, right? Let's just say this is somehow a three class problem, orange, green, and blue. <clears throat> and if the GANs learns, then it should be able to generate somewhere in within this like red dotted line. Um, <clears throat> it might not actually even generate, you know, samples on the edges as well, which is really good. However, um, again, if we have, a, let's say a generator or discriminator that's too strong, we're gonna get um, essentially one of these two. So I would say if the vanishing gradient most likely often happens because the discriminator is too strong. So again, um, the discriminator, when the get, uh, generator generates something, right? At least in the initial stages, it'll probably generate something very unrealistic. So it's gonna be very out of the way. But if the discriminator is too strong, it already knows it's not real and there's no positive feedback for it. But then, um, because there is no positive feedback or there's less of it, it can't really push itself towards uh, the real distribution because, again, anything it tries to do, the discriminator is just going to say no and no and no. Um, <clears throat> versus mode collapse, it's kind of where the generator is almost too strong or got too strong too fast that the discriminator can't tell, um, like it's exploring the data space essentially. So <clears throat> let's just say within the MNIST example, the GAN was so strong that it uh, learned how to draw, let's say, the number one very well. Well, the number one is, yes, technically in the uh, realistic distribution, but um, you really want to also kind of expand that point in that sense that, like, you want one, two, three, four, all of those numbers instead of just ones. Because technically, yes, GANs generating realistic ones are good, but you know, you don't want to just generate ones in a sense. Um, <clears throat> like visually, I guess, uh, this is kind of the vanishing gradient, at least in some like MNIST experiments, right? So you start out with some sort of random noise <clears throat> and it can't really uh, get to a point in which it generates any um, realistic or theoretically uh, stable samples in a sense. So you just get random noise and it can't really, you know, uh, focus However, <clears throat> mode collapse, again, you could start from random noise, which, you know, it still learns some things, but then it generates something that's, I guess, realistic enough, um, but it doesn't explore it afterwards. So at the bottom, you can see kind of <clears throat> the two cases here. On the top is sort of an ideal GAN training. So it starts from a, like a random latent space distribution. It starts to quote unquote explore samples to um, generate. And then <clears throat> near the end of the training, it starts to slowly kind of dial down uh, where the samples are. So this, these are the real samples, right? Let's just say these dots. So eventually it can generate, you know, samples at each of the points. <clears throat> However, uh, mode collapse is the one where, again, it kind of focuses or like gets too strong and uh, I guess in a local minima. And then you get only one point generation. Again, the same thing as like ones. So that's not good. Um, and so uh, I would say now um, <clears throat> a lot of the networks are mostly CNN based or I guess convolutional based. So before you could have even just had like very linear layers and in the very early examples, you could see that. But now um, <clears throat> they mostly, I mean, almost everybody does uh, some sort of convolutions and um, I guess, uh, I would say, what is it? No normalization layers because the training is a little more stable in that sense. Um, so again, this is kind of, kind of 
you know, hammering down the point that you can't have a grandmaster go up as a kid and the kid to learn anything useful out of it. But if there's actually two grandmasters, then you have a great game of chess in a sense. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, GANs is a synthetic image generation method. So I'm just gonna show you a lot of images uh, in a bit, but you can see um, <clears throat> this is from the original paper and there are like different, uh, I guess the different rows uh, connotate like different uh, methods. So I think, I don't exactly remember which rows are which, but <clears throat> it's like one of the, one of these are like maximum likelihood estimators. Uh, some are Markov change. And you can see that, you know, there's some good images for sure. The last row is uh, the GANs generated images, I believe. But, you know, all of these images look pretty good. However, obviously, you know, you're gonna show your best work uh, as like yours essentially. But uh, so yes, yeah, <clears throat> that's sort of, I guess, GANs in general. Um, this is some of the head CT GANs that I worked on that I generated. Obviously, um, these are the real <laughs> images. They look really good because they're real, but uh, the fake images don't look that bad either. Um, <clears throat> at least, you know, parts of the skull wise. This looks like it came, it could be somewhat similar to this. Um, the only thing is obviously there's probably some like soft tissue um, <clears throat> details that the GANs is actually missing other than these. But again, uh, it's realistic enough for I guess the GANs to generate and learn things. And I guess later on, I'll kind of show um, <clears throat> how in my experiments at least, that it does improve classification performance. So um, <clears throat> this is like, I guess a quote unquote, I don't wanna say Christmas tree, but like a family root or what is it like? Yeah, family roots or like dynasty of Gans in a sense. So you have the one in 2014, and then <clears throat> there's kind of different offshoots in a sense of where they wanted to add more information, make it more stable or um, do, you know, interesting things with GANs. So <clears throat> on the far left, and I guess this one here, you have kind of, I guess these three in a sense are architectures in which they <clears throat> added um, in a sense convolutional networks or progressive growing or even um, change the discriminators so that the GAN training is more stable. Again, uh, the original GANs is really just a framework of like two models fighting against each other, <clears throat> but it doesn't really kind of go into any detail about uh, the specific architecture to use or maybe even best practices. Uh, DC GANs is again, the deep convolutional network. So it's kind of going from like, um, <clears throat> you know, MLPs to actual deep networks, right? So that's kind of the jump there. Um, <clears throat> these ones right here is kind of adding or reconstructing the conditional input or even the latent space. So conditional GANs is sort of the, <clears throat> you instead of, well, I'll show it in uh, later pictures, but essentially you want to guide the generator. So again, if you look back to the, I guess the three color sample, <clears throat> you can still generate realistic images, but um, do you just want a random bag of it or do you want to kind of control where you can look at it? So that's kind of the conditional input. Uh, InfoGAN is also kind of, again, trying to um, understand or uh, figure out the latent space in which the GANs generated images are synthesized from. Uh, ACGAN <clears throat> is the reconstruction of the class label, which is actually a little more stable. Um, essentially, you go through the conditional GANs and then the ACGAN actually has two branches in which it one tries to see if the image is real or not, and two tries to see if it can determine which class it is from that image and then see, um, propagate the losses that way. Um, <clears throat> yeah, stock GAN is pretty much the same thing where there's actual multiple inputs in a sense. So instead of just like a generate ones or twos or threes or whatever for me, I could say, okay, <clears throat> here's an image of a bird can you make it more yellow or uh, make it a red bird or something like that? And 
Finally, there's image translation methods. So again, pix to pix is a famous example where <clears throat> you have one domain of images and then you translate to another in a pairwise manner. Um, and CycleGans is kind of, in a sense, a upgraded version of it or two pix to pixes against each other. So CycleGans is unpaired training, which is actually very useful in medical imaging for sure. Uh, one question. I think Anand mm -hmm. has his hand up. Uh, sorry, I didn't yeah. see. Uh, yeah, I have a question uh, regarding like the way we train uh, generator discriminator because uh, so when generator generates something, discriminator says uh, whether it is a real image or fake image. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I'm assuming it just won't be whether it's real or fake. It gives some kind of input because uh, <clears throat> suppose given a six, uh, 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 generator generates something near to six, then discriminator gives yeah, it is kind of real, but a bit fake, that kind of information. Uh, uh, so what kind of loss functions we use? And uh, while thinking about that, I, I understood that like we might have to use different loss functions to generate different kinds of things. Like if we are generating images, we might have to use dice coefficient in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are doing it for uh, text, we might have to use a different loss function. Right? Yeah. So no, I what... mean, that's a great question actually. Um, <clears throat> and honestly, that's kind of, I guess one, one of still the biggest problems in GANs, especially kind of uh, figuring out the loss functions. And I think you kind of hit the nail on the head, right? And it, I guess uh, the kind of answer varies on the type of GAN architecture you're using. So because let's just say <clears throat> we use a very vanilla GANs, right? A vanilla GANs to uh, generate MNIST samples. So <clears throat> in that sense, the discriminator, or I guess the losses that are being propagated is really just going to be, is it real or fake? So it's not going to say, oh, <clears throat> this one looks real because it is very close to the realistic distribution of the ones, or um, this two is real because it looks like a two or it's close to the distribution of the two. The GAN as a whole is going to see all of the numbers, right? Um, I guess in a sense, like you could see, um, like if I draw a number right here or whatever number I draw, I know that um, <clears throat> like places like the corners, right, are usually going to be black. And that's probably where the discriminator is going to, going to focus on, like focus on the center and figure out if there is like, um, I guess in, uh, I guess, MNIST sort of ways, are there like distinct clear lines? Uh, is it like fuzzy or not? And then it's going to say, yes, this is real or fake. However, in conditional GANs, that's exactly um, kind of what you said, where <clears throat> the loss functions are actually going to figure out, OK, um, <clears throat> if I give it the condition of one or generate you know, a label one, then it's going to hopefully synthesize something that looks like a one, right? And then the discriminator is also going to say, hey, this input that I'm getting is going to be a one. So let's look at <clears throat> the input that I get. Is it near the distribution of uh, real ones there are? And then re uh, <clears throat> feeds back the losses in that sense. So different, uh, I guess, based on these type of uh, GANs, there's that. Like AC GANs, again, is sort of like a branch of GANs in a sense, where there's another part of the GANs where it tries to figure out the actual label from the AC GAN. So there's a real or fake um, sort of loss. And then there's a, hey, <clears throat> is uh, this discriminator is going to see, is it say one through nine? And is that, uh, I guess, actual uh, discriminator, or I guess the correct labeling, is that correct or not? And that loss is also fed back. Um, picks to picks and cycle GANs. Uh, I'd say cycle GANs is a lot easier to understand in a sense, because pix to pix is really, like you said, <clears throat> sort of, I don't want to say a dice loss. Um, you can do like even MSE or maybe even divergence losses. A lot of it is like KL divergences, but it's really <clears throat> in pix to pix because you have a paired image, right? You have this ground truth that you're trying to one distill and then um, decode back into the ground truth. Truth. So you can kind of compare it against each other. Like you could do any sort of methods like SSIM, MLE, all of those losses. 
But with cycle GANs, <clears throat> the great thing is because there's two architectures, you're kind of going back and forth, right? Um, <clears throat> so if you go from A to B, yes, there is a way. Uh, unfortunately, because there's no um, paired images, you can't do like a ground truth comparison. But you know that if you go from A to B and then B back to A, then you know that <clears throat> whatever the input and whatever the output from that back and forth should be very similar. So there's that cycle loss. And then there's the identity loss of if I want to do A to B, but I feed it a B into that network, the image should not change. So there's two losses competing in that sense. Um, yeah, and then there's like all sorts of other losses for sure. Uh, in cycle game, when you're saying uh, like provided A to B is given, is mm -hmm. A the output of the discriminator as a generator and B the feedback to a uh, generator from the discriminator? Is that what? Um, I think I might actually have a architecture here. Yeah, right here. So okay. <clears throat> this is kind of the, so there's the A to B generator, and then there's a B discriminator, right? So let's just say, uh, I guess a classic example of like horse to zebras, right? If A is horses and B are zebras, <clears throat> I have a generator that can take a horse and change it into zebras. And then this discriminator B is going to say, well, is this a zebra? Is this a real zebra or like a horse that's been changed into zebra? And then from there you have the gener classic like generator and discriminator losses. But then there's also the losses that are communicating uh, with each other in a sense of <clears throat> if, it, if this input goes back and forth, there's a loss that is, I guess, not outlined here, but it's the identity or the cycle losses. Does that answer your question a little bit? Uh, yeah, yes. Okay, cool. <clears throat> and honestly, that's... Um, a really good question that I did not expect to come up this early because again, the losses are kind of like the huge thing in GANs where again, it's a very simple architecture or framework in a sense, but if you make a very clever loss, then it's, or not clever, but um, smart losses for your task, it can work amazingly well. But if your losses are not good for the task, then uh, you're gonna have a lot of problems. And I think um, <clears throat> uh, we had it in our Hitty meeting the other day about um, he was doing, um, I think, auto encoders to generate, um, what is it, DEXA scans. And I asked him, hey, why didn't you guys use GANs, right? Because it's just kind of like almost image synthesis or image translation. And he told us, <clears throat> well, the losses that we were trying to calculate for these GANs were not working out well. Um, they had to essentially make a very interesting sort of loss where <clears throat> they generated the image and then from the generated image they extracted like the dex values of like body fat percentage muscle mass or whatever and then the difference from the true of those values were fed back as a loss to the other encoder so in that sense um it'd be very difficult for the generator and discriminator kind of uh work out well okay <clears throat> So, uh, I mean, I won't bore you with the architecture, but really, again, DC GANs is these three aspects. So the convolutional transpose and convolutions, batch normalizations, and then the ReLU activations. Essentially, these three pieces, which are, again, very common in regular um, CNN models, were the kind of thing that made a lot of the now GANs models uh, more stable in their training. Um, <clears throat> so these GANs kind of allowed going from this like three channel 32 by 32 images, which is, you know, very small, but still pretty big in a sense to go up to, you know, 64 by 64 or even, um, 256 by 256. Um, obviously this isn't a t that image, but I couldn't really find some, um, <clears throat> condition again, again, you have this generated and discriminatory loss, but again, these losses are based on the conditions that are input to the discriminator as well. Um, so this is kind of what I was saying about there's a regular GANs and there's a conditional GANs. So in regular GANs, if you just ask it for a sample, it's going to give you whatever it wants to in a sense. Um, <clears throat> so it could give you a shoe 
uh, uh, pants or uh, I guess purses or whatever. But if you have a conditional GANs or at least some sort of conditional input um, that is uh, tuned in the training, then you can say, okay, generate me some t-shirts, generate me some pants, some long sleeves. And you can at least uh, kind of focus the uh, generation aspect of it. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the HCT ones that I did. So these are different hemorrhage classes, and then this is the normal class. Um, obviously, there's some weird ones like these that are cut off, but again, to a, a I think a lay person, it doesn't look half bad. And pics to pics again, it's kind of the again. Uh, I guess half of this, in a sense, just the A to B, in a sense, is the pix to pix And then if you combine two of them together with those identity and cycle losses, you get the cycle gears. And <clears throat> you get, you know, pretty powerful stuff because, <coughs> excuse me, uh, again, classic horse to zebra models, right? So you have this brown horse and then it turns into a zebra, which is pretty cool. Uh, you have, again, all of these horses. and the cool thing is, again, these are unpaired images, right? Um, so, you know, it's never seen a horse, or I guess this is a horse input. So it, the model has probably never seen a zebra that has this pose, but somehow it could figure out, hey, there's um, this input. <clears throat> and it's not as simple as, oh, just turn all the brown uh, fur into black or white fur, right? Um, there's more uh, nuance to it in a sense that it can learn. And then there's like apples to oranges. Um, <clears throat> this one I think is very interesting in the sense that, um, so you have this translational technique, but you can also use that, take that advantage of that to get the difference, to get um, sort of these uh, removing or adding tumors. <clears throat> um, okay. So uh, any questions about the GANs so far, I guess, before I go into actual, uh, I guess, more interesting variations? Uh, Jason, one more thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the previous slide where you were explaining about uh, uh, the, the previous, uh, even before, I guess. OK, sure. Uh, so there was an architecture where you showed like uh, uh, the discriminator and uh, uh, even before. Uh, very short discriminant. Yeah, this one. Uh, okay. So you said that in DC GANs, like use mm -hmm. a con uh, deep convolution GANs, these humans. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, provided the uh, the import for a discriminator is image, yeah, we look at convolutions, bash convolutions. And if the final layer is a real layer, a real layer usually gives a linear output, right? Uh, so uh, provided given uh, uh, image, uh, how would a linear output uh, 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 be giving the feedback? Uh, how would a linear output be giving a feedback? Uh, um, so I expected like uh, in the previous instance, you said that for one era GANs, uh, we use uh, uh, a simple one zero thing. Uh, one means not fake, mm -hmm. or zero means fake, something of that sort. Right. Uh, uh, so I thought it would be a sigmoid layer. Or, yeah, uh, if you have more classes, it could be a soft max layer. Right. Uh, so how would a zero layer work in deep uh, DC GANs? Uh, so I guess maybe this doesn't explain it that well. So the discriminator, so what I mean by the convolution batch normalization of ReLU are kind of uh, the in-betweens in a sense. So, you know, in a regular, um, let's say CNN model, right? You have the image input and then you have all of these convolutions, normalizations, ReLU activations, maybe even some dropouts if you want. So you have all of those. And then at the end, at the classification layer, you have, you know, either like a flattened vector or whatever it is. And then you have the I put linear layer with like a soft max or soft max or sigmoid, right? So I guess I didn't include that part in the last little bit, but essentially it is what you were saying, where <clears throat> um, you have this, uh, I guess, convolutions and batch normalizations to get all of those features extracted, and then from there it's like the same as like a regular CNN, where you just have some sort of uh, activation layer to say. It's either a zero one or whatever multi-class task you want. Okay, so ReLU is not the final activation. It's just the in-between activation. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and honestly, this is a discriminator. You can just think of it as just like a regular 
uh, classifier essentially, or I guess a CNN classifier. And the generator in a sense is pretty much the same thing. It's just that you just have a convolutional transpose. <clears throat> okay, uh, any other questions so far? I know I'm kind of moving pretty fast. Okay. There's no like simple question. So if you don't understand something, just ask. <clears throat> yeah. And yeah, I mean, I, I like talking about it and also um, I'm sure if I get hit with a question that I'm not too sure about, that's a good thing. That means I have more to learn, so. Okay, um, I'll just move on if nobody has anything so far. So this is a, <clears throat> I guess a GAN review that we did uh, for medical GANs specifically. So we went through you know, a lot of uh, sources. We kind of screened for papers, again, 2015 to present, just so we said, okay, well, GAN was only started 2014, let's give it like a little buffer so that some applications to medical images were you know, seen. And then we extracted a lot of those images. Um, <clears throat> we screened for them and we had a lot of papers screened out, but you know, it's really kind of, we had a very specific role in a sense. We wanted to make sure it was about classification or segmentation. And I guess in a small way also synthesis, but those were the ones that we included in, the, in our study. And from there, and you know, from the previous slides, there's really kind of the quote unquote big three, at least I think, uh, in medical images. So there's the conditional GANs, which again, you kind of want <clears throat> to generate, you know, medical images of let's say tumors, right? You don't want to generate an image, or maybe even in the head CT case, you don't want to generate uh, make a generator <clears throat> of epidural hemorrhages only, and then train another one for uh, su uh, subdural and then for intraparenchymal, or you can have a lot of models, which is kind of heavy and, you know, not ideal. But with conditional GANs, you can just have one, you know, quote unquote hemorrhage generator, or maybe even head CT generator, and you could condition it to say, hey, give me epidural, give me uh, subdural, give me whatever, right? Um, <clears throat> DC GANs, obviously, we need DC GANs because a lot of medical images are, you know, 256 by 256 or even 512 by 512. Um, obviously different variations of it can be applied because, you know, I'm sure everybody's seen like mammograph images that are like a couple thousand pixels, which is really big. Um, and then, you know, picks to picks and cycle GANs. Uh, a lot of the traditionally uh, <clears throat> applied cases for picks to picks and cycle GANs architectures in medical imaging were really, you know, kind of like super resolution. So you have this like low, low resolution image and then you wanna make it bigger and, but keep the detail. So there's that, <clears throat> there's also denoising and maybe even some artifact removal in the images. But <clears throat> a lot of it, I guess, in, and I guess maybe the reason why we said classification and segmentation is, a lot of times um, these papers are just gonna say, hey, these images look really good. Uh, nobody can tell the difference if it's real or fake. And that was kind of it. Um, which, you know, I, <clears throat> I guess if you're wanting to generate like horses and zebras, it's good enough. But in especially medical applications, you want some clinical or quantifiable uh, metrics that you can test on because you know you could show people like oh yeah hey this is you know <clears throat> uh what a brain with a tumor would look like and it looks real enough that's not going to cut it right you're going to have to actually show hey this is where it is or this is what it looks like or you know it somehow improve classification performance so um <clears throat> this is a slide that i actually really like and maybe judy might not like because this is from the paper, uh, how to fool radiologists with GANs. Um, so if, can any of you guys tell which one is fake or real? And don't look at the red lines and green lines. They're, all of them have a mix of real and fake images. Can anybody yeah, tell? Judy, do you want to try? <laughs> 
Uh, she's she's the expert, so she'll go last, you know. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's let's call on Chima. Do you want to try one? Anyone? Uh, let me see. So is it like the specific block? Yeah, yeah. So like any one of these uh, blocks. So half of them are real, half mm -hmm. of them are fake. So you got a 50-50. Let's see, maybe top, let me annotate it actually. Yeah. <clears throat> this one. Fake is what I'll say. Okay, so. Uh, Anybody else? Maybe Zach. I'm just calling out people's mm -hmm. names who I know. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So, um, unfortunately for you, Chima, uh, Zach is correct and you are incorrect. But that's that's the hard part, actually, because so even for me, I guess. I'm no radiologist, but I guess I've looked at enough GANS images, or at least I thought I did, um, to understand like, oh, you know, clearly this one looks like GANS and maybe like these look like GANS because <clears throat> in a lot of GAN, GANS images, kind of a telltale sign is when you look at the edges of it, or maybe if you see like some of these like grid light patterns, um, it's, you know, faint, but you can still see it, right? Uh, Turns out uh, for all of the red ones, the first 18 are real and the rest are fake. And then for the green ones, the last 18 are fake. So this one actually was real, which I thought was fake for a long time. So, <clears throat> but again, I mean, to be very, very fair to you guys, these are very low, low resolution images. It's only 56 by 56. So, I mean, I, I doubt, you know, a lot of people can tell anything. Yeah, it's, oh, actually, no, sorry. It was the bottom three, bottom half. I was wrong again. Um, yeah, so, okay. So I guess maybe an even harder case. Um, which one of these do you guys think is real or fake? Again, 50-50. These are hard to tell. They look really close to real. Yeah, I feel, like, I feel like I feel like the left is fake. Okay. Um, Jason Anant mm -hmm. asks, can you circle back on the cycle guns explanation? I don't know. If that cycle, would... Circle back to cycle gun. Okay. I guess uh, which part of the uh, explanation? Uh, so it says uh, in, in the example, like a counter map or segmentation or different image modality, but I uh, must have so. Uh, uh, so if you you give an image of uh, 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 let's say in our case just X-ray uh, and ask uh, a different modality is that what cycle is? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, so in the example says like uh, so you give an example you give uh, uh, the input as an image. So I'm assuming that uh, the generator will get an image. Uh, let's mm -hmm. say in this case just X-ray. Right. Uh, are we asking it to convert it into a different modality? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So we can do that. So um, it depends on how you want to do it, right? So you, uh, this translation sort of method, you can do in any sort of way. So again, uh, maybe uh, this image kind of shows it, right? So you could go from one modality to another or more one, uh, I guess, phase to another. So there's, you know, these both are technically MRIs, right? Flare and T1. But going from <clears throat> Flare to T1, that is a translation, right? Because uh, although they're both MRIs, you're going from FLIR to T1 and they're kind of um, showing different, uh, I guess, attributes of the soft tissue based on the magnetic resonance, right? Um, there's also a lot of papers going from, you know, <clears throat> uh, maybe even CT scans to MRIs, MRIs to CT. Uh, there's papers going from like PET to CT or even uh, getting, uh, again, this is like a higher level cellular stuff, but combining PET and CT images as two inputs and then getting a PET CT image out, right? Instead of just like a very simple overlay. So those are very interesting. Um, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, it does. And does the, uh, the uh, so let's say uh, we train the model and uh, generate a gear some model and uh, discriminate the stage, it's, it's here. 
So what we have generated an image successfully. So mm -hmm. are those images reliable? Uh, because I mean, in <clears throat> the in, in usual cases when you're trying to generate images, uh, that makes sense for dogs and cats because mm -hmm. nothing is on the line. Uh, right. Also, but in this case, uh, uh, if uh, so, uh, this this MRI in this one case, one modality has been turned to other modality, or uh, we are looking at a different part of the same tissue. Uh, mm -hmm. Are these images reliable? The GANs uh, or the images generated by GANs reliable? Yeah, actually. Well, so that is actually in the later part of my talk where we kind of show a use case in a sense of <clears throat> having this translation and trying to map it back to actual household units, right? So this was a CT and dual energy CT case where we tried to see if we can generate synthetic dual energy CT. And obviously uh, the biggest part <clears throat> or I guess the, um, not the biggest, uh, maybe one of the more important parts about CT is that it has electronic density information, right? Household units. And when people are trying to do any sort of uh, treatments, especially with radiation therapy, you want to make sure you have these household units correct because that really affects how the radiation, you know, penetrates the body, <clears throat> how the treatment works, how the stopping um, power and everything is calculated, right? And we kind of show later on, I'll show in the slides, that with certain techniques, we can make it uh, fairly reliable. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I did not give uh, an honest, like a list of questions to ask, but that's a good question. Um, but yeah, okay. <clears throat> so I guess going back, uh, the left one is actually fake. Um, and this is the true CT. And honestly, I can't tell the difference <laughs> again, which is good. Um, I was like putting these slides together yesterday or I mean, a few days ago. <clears throat> and when I was doing that, I actually forgot which one was which. So I did like do a double take. Um, but yeah, so again, these are 512 by 512 images and these are very high resolution. So you can see that um, it works very well. Um, so uh, I guess the two big, uh, aspects, I guess, or applications that I was just talking about was the <clears throat> classification or segmentation, and then there's segmentation, right? So again, <clears throat> uh, using this conditional approach to generate images of, you know, uh, epidural head CT or um, disease or not diseased images, <clears throat> there's segmentation. Again, this is like sort of like the translation stuff where in this specific approach, the GAN generator will actually generate <clears throat> a synthetic X-ray or chest X-ray and a synthetic, um, uh, what is it, uh, segmentation. And then both pairs are input into the discriminator to say, is this real or fake? And actually that's really cool. And then I think this was also something very similar where, oh yeah, this is just segmentation, right? So you're translating a real CT into a segmentation and comparing it to the ground truth, uh, losses are calculated, like die score, and then it is fed back into the network. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'll kind of go over this pretty quick. Um, with tasks, you know, you could see that DC GANs, you, I mean, everything is kind of spread out. DC GANs is mostly classification generation because again, it's more of a, uh, I would say stabilization technique because in a really, if I wanted to be really technical, like in, in all of the conditional GANs and pixel picks on vanilla GAN architectures, uh, some form of convolution was used. So technically they could all be DC GANs or DC GANs could be part of all of them. Um, <clears throat> looking at medical domains, obviously pulmonology of like, you know, chest x-rays, those are pretty big. Neurology, so head CTs, cardiology, hearts, uh, synology, synology is like the breast, um, the gastroenterol, like abdomen stuff. <clears throat> and then by modality, obviously CT and MRI are the highest. Uh, they have a lot of them. Pets, there's some of them. Um, and obviously chest x-rays are pretty big. And then there's, you know, other uh, imaging modalities that are pretty big as well. Okay, <clears throat> so going to the applications. Um, this is an interesting paper in the sense that um, I think I said a while back that there's like um, stack GANs, right? So <clears throat> in a sense, they have the seed mass. So they just say, hey, here's a uh, mass. 
<clears throat> and then they add these um, medical descriptors. So what they want to say is, okay, so <clears throat> here's a mass, make it more round and specular or make it more, um, <clears throat> uh, I, don't, I don't know any of the other descriptors, honestly, but essentially it can go for, uh, take an image, make it more um, of whatever these uh, descriptions are and then make a generated mass. <clears throat> so uh, I guess we're just kind of going run, them running through it. You know, they these embedding spaces is going to push this image into a certain other direction in the latent space that has these descriptors, right? <clears throat> and then from there, the decoder will actually generate these images. So whatever this was, now it is more, I don't know, specular or uh, whatever other, <laughs> other words that can be described. So that's pretty cool. <clears throat> And you can see here, <clears throat> from those embeddings, you could actually interpolate between them, right? So you have this A, which, are, which is real, and here's the B, which is real. And you could actually go through in a sort of um, embedding space, a linear way from A to B. And you can see sort of a progression, right? Um, <clears throat> again, I'm no um, expert on masses, but let's just say this is, I don't know, benign and this is uh, malignant. You could actually interpolate from a benign thing uh, node to a malignant one throughout this embedding space, making it more and more of these sort of descriptors, which is really cool. <clears throat> um, and I think, yeah, this is like specific margins and kind of weights that they use. So, you know, they said ill-defined margin and a round shape, and then it's kind of, how uh, like how much of an influence essentially the embedding space has are these like numbers. Um, okay, so those are that. There's progressive current gas again. I think I showed like it can generate very highly realistic images, and you know they kind of have this like swapping in and out sort of thing. I think there's a chat. <clears throat> All right, what's the difference between autoencoder and GANs? Um, okay, so. That's that's a difficult question because I feel like they're sort of the same, but they're not. Um, <clears throat> in a sense, the well, okay. So autoencoder, uh, in a sense, might be a little closer to some of the translation methods than a pure GANs, in a sense because a pure GANs will just you know, generate an image and then the discriminator will say, this is real or fake, right? Because technically in a very um, not hands wavy sort of way, um, the GANs discriminator or any of the discriminators is kind of encoding whatever visual information into a vector, right? So in a way you could see it as a encoder. Um, <clears throat> and I guess, but GANs, uh, it's really mostly the, I guess, the architecture between the generating discriminator, not the, you know, uh, I guess, encoding and decoding aspect of it. But obviously in these like translations, it's, I feel like it's very similar, but, you know, I think it's also kind of how you wanna uh, kind of set those boundaries in a sense. Does that uh, make sense for you, Toby? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I guess I didn't know exactly how far you guys went into the autoencoder aspect of it um, in the paper. So I just kind of. Yeah, I, I was confused because it. Yeah. in, in autoencoder, in auto they also make use of latent space, mm -hmm. which, is, which is similar to GANs so for translation. Uh, so I got confused. Right. Yeah, it's, it's a little confusing because um, so in a very uh, quote unquote basic GANs, the latent space is already, you know, just random, right? Um, so there's no encoded information within it. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, you can sort of decode the information through conditional labeling or um, the AC GANs, so the auxiliary classifier GANs. So you, you're kind of trying to figure out in this latent space, oh yeah, this is more where the ones are generated. These are where the twos are and all of that. So in a sense, you could, 
quote unquote decode in a sense, uh, the latent space. But <clears throat> really, I feel like GANS is more like this aspect of decoding it from the latent space, but then autoencoder is sort of like this aspect where, but then again, sort of the other architectures of GANS is going to be kind of this, right? So it's, it's confusing for sure. <laughs> okay, uh, any other questions so far? Okay, um, so yeah, I mean, progressive going GANS, there's this sort of trade-off between um, you generate whatever image that you have or whatever size of image you have. <clears throat> and then once it's a, at a stable state, you kind of add this secondary layer to make it even bigger, but then you slowly transition it from one architecture to another. So you have this uh, alpha aspect of how much weight is from this 16 by 16 generator that is just doubled versus 16 by 16 through another convolution to make it 32 by 32. And then these are mixed together to input into the discriminator. And you know, obviously this is discriminator. Um, <clears throat> from there, I mean, that's kind of how you get like a super high resolution images up to like 1024 by 1024. Um, but obviously the default is you're kind of training one GANs for a while, and then you're training the next GANs for a while, and then whatever next one, and then next, next, next. So you're kind of training <clears throat> multiple GANs in a serial manner up until the resolution that you want. So it'll take quite a bit longer than normal GANs. Um, <clears throat> fixed point GAN, this one I really like because it has a lot of usefulness in the sense of um, sort of detection. <clears throat> so you can see that um, here, um, fixed point GAN, they're kind of trying to show like that uh, it really is trying to focus on the specific aspect of um, what they're trying to change. Like they're trying to preserve everything else, but the attribute that they're trying to change. And what they show is these, uh, you know, the red is the star GAN, which again, star GANs is sort of like uh, a multiplication of cycle GANs. So there's multiple branches of A, <clears throat> A to B, A to C, A to D and D to A and all of those stuff. <clears throat> Where a six point GAN, Again, it's trying to one, preserve the background information and only translate the information. So they show in this first input <coughs> in Stargans, when you try to make them have black hair, you sort of get this mustache for some reason, which, you know, that's not what you asked for. But with fixed point GAN, <coughs> you don't have a mustache. Uh, for here, like this one here, you can see, um, they said black hair to black hair. It somehow added more hair to this person in Stargans. <clears throat> but here you can see that it preserves the hair information or at least uh, uh, quote unquote lack thereof in a sense. So that's really good. <clears throat> application wise, and again, this is sort of like the translation or uh, cycle GANs translational losses. Uh, I'm checking the, okay. Progressive growing GANs wouldn't uh, vanish gradient problem effect that training the wall chain again on top of again generated images yeah so <clears throat> for progressive growing gans uh, vanishing gradients will somewhat happen um it's just that this alpha factor sorry this alpha factor will definitely uh help in the vanishing or reducing the vanishing gradient um so in a sense in an ideal world um or I guess ideal training in a sense, the GAN discriminator and generator will never kind of trump each other. So there wouldn't be uh, this uh, vanishing gradient in a sense, um, oh, ideally. <clears throat> and so it would kind of be at a standstill. And then that's when you kind of have this switching going on instead of going from uh, big image to big image where you may or may not have a standstill because the one, the discriminator is going to, you know, uh, more often than not, the discriminator is going to be able to learn way quicker than the generator. So that's why you kind of have to be aware of 
the <clears throat> learning rates for the general image discriminator. Okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, so I mean, again, uh, there's the fixed point. Essentially, it's kind of like the cycle consistency loss, but uh, on the whole background in a sense. And from there, there's a lot of localization and stuff that you can see, which is really cool. Um, <clears throat> so you can see at the top is the star again, bottom is the fixed point again. You have this input and then you have the output. So this is eyeglass localization. So if you, it's trying to remove glasses from these pictures, right? But preserve the rest of the information. When you look at the differences, you can see, uh, I mean, it's a little hard to see with the gray scale, but <clears throat> in these like green lines, these are the differences that it's doing. So you can see like in Stargans, you know, there's still little points here and there in the background that are being changed, which isn't great, but you can see in the fixed point again, like it really only looked at the eyes and removed the glasses, which is very good. Um, <clears throat> here they say negative examples. So essentially try to remove glasses from somebody who doesn't have glasses. And you can see in the differences, there's some you know differences within the backgrounds. But in the fixed point again, there's very little. <clears throat> Obviously in the medical applications, you can see um, sort of brain lesion localization. So if you say remove a tumor from a image that has a tumor, and then you take the difference, you'll exactly find out where the tumor is. Versus if they don't have a tumor, there will be no difference. So that's really cool. And, you know, pulmonary embolism and all of that stuff. Uh, okay. So we don't <clears throat> answer your question. Yeah. Uh, I feel like, yeah, um, do you need any more clarification, Toby? Yeah, you, you previously <clears throat> mentioned um, there's a type of guns that um, can be used to remove tumors. Mm -hmm. So is it like, does it work differently from fixed point gun? Uh, it's pretty much the same thing. So I guess fixed point GAN is um, <clears throat> the same thing as in removing it. It's just that it's trying to remove just what you're trying to focus on. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and again, <clears throat> a lot of these translations and techniques uh, is not, it's, it's technically, you know, not for localization, right? It's really translation technique that you can use to localize. Um, so these architectures, uh, at least this brain tumor one, right? It's trying to um, <clears throat> remove the tumor from tumor images. However, you know, it's not like <laughs> you're gonna show a patient, hey, here's your head CT with the tumor. We use the GANs, we quote unquote removed it for you. That's not, you know, that's clinic not at all relevant. But if you could remove, quote unquote, remove the tumor and then localize exactly where the tumor is, then we could say, okay, <clears throat> we know exactly where it is. Let's start, you know, doing the treatment or I guess focus on those areas for treatment. So there's very relevant cases of these translational techniques. Um, this is again, more of the brain localization stuff, which again, you could see a lot of these regions, right? Um, and I think, yeah, like star again, you could see like, I mean, <laughs> if the green lines were actual tumors, like that would not <laughs> look good for you. But uh, for fixed point GAN, it really localizes on the specific like local areas, which is good. Okay, <clears throat> so um, and then this is kind of, what you were talking about, about the actual implications, right? Because sure, I could show you pretty images every day, but that's not gonna make anybody better. Um, <clears throat> so this was one of our papers that we recently like put in or uh, submitted. So we wanted to kind of go from single energy CT images and then synthetically generate dual energy CT images. The reason being um, <clears throat> dual energy CT uh, comparatively has a higher like conspicuity. Essentially, it's kind of saying, um, uh, what is it? Conspicuity is essentially the difference between the background in a sense. So it highlights like bleeding or lesions a little bit better. And that's kind of uh, the key point of 
uh, dual energy CCT. <clears throat> There's also like material decomposition that you could go into, but at least, uh, at least for this audience, I don't think <laughs> we need to go into that. So uh, our data set, we had a data set of these rapid switch CTs. So essentially, it really quickly goes from 70 kV to 50 kV to virtual unenhancement to iodine and all of these stuff, right? And it's been shown at least clinically uh, in a lot of literature that <clears throat> this dual energies uh, 70 kV image is equivalent to a regular single energy <clears throat> 100 kV image. And there's almost like no variation between it. So we said, okay, <clears throat> we have this data set where one of the images is essentially the same as a regular CT image or a single energy CT image. And we have all of the ground truths for 50 iodine and VUE. Let's see if we can translate these 70 kV images to 50 iodine and VUE and see if it can preserve the relevant Hounsfeld unit information that we need to. So <clears throat> if you look at these images, we actually use the single energy CT image to generate uh, 50 iodine and VUE. The top row um, is the ground truth. So again, this is the rapid switch going from 70 to 50, 70 to iodine and all of that stuff. <clears throat> the middle is actually, uh, let's say pix to pix. So one of the translational techniques, so this is a paired image. And then at the bottom is cycle GANs. So uh, this was actually kind of a very interesting thing that I did notice. Um, I mean, not to spoil anything, but overall the pix to pix actually worked way better. Um, or not, I wouldn't say way better. It was more consistent in generating um, true Hansfeld unit viral use correctly to the target. <clears throat> but you can see like these aspects here, Pix to Pix somehow wasn't good at um, picking up, I guess, clothes in a sense, which, you know, don't get me wrong. Like, I don't care if you miss uh, generate my clothes as long as you generate, you know, my organs way better, right? So that's fine. Um, but I thought it was very kind of weird or maybe interesting in a sense. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so essentially, we have this pix to pix architecture, which is, um, it's a slightly different pix to pix. So it's a pix to pix HD. So what it does is essentially, it's kind of like a mix between regular pix to pix and um, the progressive growing GANs. But instead of <clears throat> doing these stepwise uh, progressions, it kind of makes a quote unquote fine uh, generator and then a coarse generator. So it kind of splits the training of like the higher resolution aspect and the lower resolution aspect separately and then adds them together. Uh, cycle GANs is kind of the same thing, but again, unpaired, right? So, um, <clears throat> and again, I guess this is kind of going into the realism aspect of, right, um, for Anand. So we have, again, the input. We have the 50 kV that's generated <clears throat> synthetic, remember, of pix to pix HD. And then here's the pixel uh, cycle GANs output. And then here's the true target 50 kV. <clears throat> so when we plot them out, at least within this red line, the actual intensities that we get out of the images, and you know, kind of going back to Hansfeld units from the normalized images, <clears throat> we see that it's matching very well. So again, the red is the target, the 50 kV. The blue is uh, pix to pix and the green is cycle GANs. And I don't know about you, but this looks like it's matching very well. Now, if we see the differences, <clears throat> again, this is just a difference, um, absolute value differences on the sides. So, I mean, obviously you can see that there's, you know, some, I guess, I think this is the vertebrae or the bone. Um, at least in the bones, there's some, you know, differences that is being highlighted and this one here. And these are the two overlays. So this difference image was overlaid on top of the true image with some color. So you could see, you know, on the, I guess the surface skin or maybe even the table, there's some differences. 
But overall, <clears throat> um, if we set the target again with that red line as the true and in zero, we see that the pixel to pix HD and psycho GANs doesn't, um, isn't too bad actually at predicting. Like there's not a huge variance. So you can see, you know, maybe there's some spikes here and there, but it actually maps pretty well. Um, from there, uh, we saw, I mean, just comparison between cycle GANs and pixel to pix. Um, pix to pix kind of, you know, stomped uh, cycle GANs. Um, but you can see, uh, everything like mean squared error, SSIM, PSNE, any of like the classic um, image uh, quantification methods or image quality methods, uh, pix to pix did very well. But that is not to say cycle GANs did, did bad. Um, it actually did pretty well in 50 kV and VUE, but obviously iodine, um, there are some <coughs> details, I guess in that iodine, instead of going from Hansfeld units to Hansfeld units, you go from Hansfeld units to like iodines per milliliter. So I think there's a range difference that is quite significant. Um, that was a little hard for cyclogans to overcome. Uh, <clears throat> okay, looking at the H, what is HU on the Y axis? So HU are, <clears throat> is Hansfeld units. So Hansfeld units is really a measure of, uh, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, Judy, uh, more of like, I guess, image intensity in a sense. It's or like not image tissue, intensity. right? Yeah, it's yeah. It's usually compared to water. Water is yeah. zero. And then it compares like, what's the density of bone <clears throat> in right. relation it, to water or what's the density <clears throat> of air or blood. Mm -hmm. And then it generates these numbers. Yeah. Um, you can think of it as like almost electron density. So again, um, Again, for a lot of CTs, at least in like, uh, I mean, I'm coming back to medical physics aspect of it, where when you're trying to do a lot of treatments, you gotta actually know the electron density because that's where the actual radiation is, is going to scatter from. And so um, obviously water is kind of like the ground truth or I guess a zero in a sense. And then air is very high, or I guess very low, I should say. Bone is very high because there's a lot of you know dense, uh, I guess, materials in a sense. Um, so, but I mean, that is a long way to say, you can kind of think of HU uh, in a very, like a clinically equivalent sense of intensity for images. Uh, yeah, got it. I, okay. I actually thought it like something related to light intensity also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can pretty much think of it that way. Um, <clears throat> obviously, um, well, I didn't show this, but uh, if you actually see it in actual normalized terms, it actually looks better. But obviously, <clears throat> going back to your earlier question, Anand, it's like, okay, sure, you can say that the intensities are very similar or the intensities are very close to each other, right? That's good and all. But in a clinical sense, you don't, like, uh, you kind of need to map it back to household units to do any sort of treatment or do any sort of um, thinking about... Uh, I guess, yeah, anything clinical, clinically relevant. <clears throat> so that's why we um, show these metrics in Hansel units. Um, okay, so going there, these are external tests. <clears throat> so now, before we went from uh, this, oh, sorry, 70 kV input, which is still technically dual energy output, right? But again, we said that this is equivalent to a single energy CT. <clears throat> well, we tried to do it with single energy CT. So this is actual single energy CT. There was no rapid switch or anything like that. This is 100 keV uh, CT image. And then from there, we generated <clears throat> iodine and 50 keV dual energy outputs. And from here, you can see in these like dotted red lines, there is a gastrointestinal bleeding. And <clears throat> again, it's a little hard to tell with like just your eyes, but at least numerically, we did see a in increase in intensity of the GI bleeds. So essentially it um, made the conspicuity or the bleed be highlighted more. Um, <clears throat> so the top row is picks to picks. The bottom row is cyclogans. Obviously the big elephant is that cyclogans looks 
terrible <laughs> because there's like little holes and stuff. And again, I think that's kind of due to the fact that one, Cycle Gittens really struggled <clears throat> generating iodine images. At least in an internal set, it was fine because I think it was a little more, the intensity ranges of the inputs and the outputs were a little more uniform versus um, <clears throat> in the single energy inputs, uh, the intensity ranges could vary quite widely. And because of that, and you know, there's like a whole pre-processing of normalization and all of that stuff. And I'm sure everybody's like kind of gone through before. It didn't, uh, it kind of clips a lot of parts out, which isn't good. Um, <clears throat> so again, uh, just numerically, they weren't like super significantly different, but you could see, at least in the input image, the bleeding was, you know, 0.19. Uh, so again, let's just say that's, uh, let's just say brightness, right? Compared to the background. And in the outputs, <clears throat> the brightness increased uh, a lot. Well, let's say increased. It wasn't significantly different, but it's still, we saw an increase, right? Um, this again, another external. So again, this is necrographic, um, I guess, images of, ooh, I believe, uh, I, I forgot exactly which. The level, the level of the kidneys. Yeah, yeah, it, I forgot what it was. Kidney stone extra cases yeah. too. Because mm -hmm. I think you can see the kidney stone. And this was a very interesting case because <clears throat> there's the contrast enhanced images. And we wanted to see, can we remove the contrast, right? Because, and the kicker was, can we remove the contrast without removing or changing the uh, kidney stone? Because, you know, when we think removal of intensities, okay, sure, it might focus on the kidney and reduce the intensities, but would it also reduce the intensity for the kidney stone? Because the kidney stones are still pretty bright. Now, <clears throat> this TUE, this true unenhanced images are not exactly one-to-one -one because, uh, <clears throat> again, they were taken at separate times. And so we just got the closest uh, slice to it. But then all of these VUEs, or I guess virtual unenhanced images, are from the necrographic images. And when we see it from here, um, you see, you know, the, the kidneys are pretty bright, right? Ooh, obviously filled with contrast. <clears throat> but then when you virtually, quote unquote, unenhance them, the uh, pix to pix does pretty well by removing the contrast. So the kidney looks pretty uniform in a sense. Um, no contrast. Cyclocan does okay, uh, but you can still see sort of a difference between the outside edges of the kidney and the inner parts of the kidney. Um, and it does remove a little bit of the, you know, um, kidney stone, but, you know, it's still not that bad, which again, we're not saying that this is a end-all be-all. We don't need dual energy CT anymore, but I think the way we looked at it, this, at least in the paper, was, hey, um, <clears throat> if a patient for some reason cannot get a dual energy CT, and we want to, but we want it because it has all of these uh, aspects of dual energy CT that we want to take advantage of, well, here's a cheap and easy way to get something very close to it that, you know, again, you don't, you shouldn't uh, rely on 100%, but you could still get some uh, images out of it. Um, so from there, we show that there isn't, I mean, there's some significant differences between <clears throat> the true unenhanced and the uh, virtually unenhanced images, but at least within the literature that we read, we saw that even in um, the dual energy CTs unenhancement, uh, it's actually going to be a little lower than the true unenhancement. So even the true uh, virtually unenhanced images are actually a little lower than the true unenhanced. So this is you know, somewhat expected. Uh, <clears throat> finally, I guess more of my stuff is ICH. Again, this is the conditional GANS paper. There is um, ICH, so intracranial hemorrhages. There's different types of it. Um, there's a huge um, 
I would say, imbalancing between normal images and uh, hemorrhage images. We tried to augment it. So then <clears throat> we did traditional augmentation, which is, you know, the geometric like rotation flipping, all that stuff. And then there's the GAN generated ones that we could just keep generating more of them. So essentially, traditional augmentation, the ratios, or I guess the generations are going to be somewhat similar to this, even though there might be more numbers based on your translations, uh, transformations, I should say. But then with GANs, you can make it so that they're all somewhat similar. From there, we show, you know, a lot of, I guess, pictures of us generating images. Um, the unfortunate thing is obviously um, it doesn't pick up the, so the middle is again generated image. It doesn't pick up the, like the actual, um, <clears throat> I, I think the fissures or the jerry and the sulci, I think it's called, of the brain that well, or even the ventricles of the brain. But at least, I guess, not looking at the inside, um, at least in the skull area, it looks pretty good. And we show <clears throat> that, well, in the binary class, it, there isn't much of a difference between traditional augmentation and any of the other GAN augmentations in the either in the hemorrhage or the normal cases. But <clears throat> if we go to actual um, class-wise examples, we show that <clears throat> conditional GANs actually improves uh, the uh, hemorrhage classes uh, more than the traditional or the traditional augmentation with balancing. So again, uh, maybe like even weighted subsampling and all of that techniques. From here, um, I just show a confusion matrix of the improvements. So we see that <clears throat> the diagonal is the correct uh, classifications. And we see that for uh, the hemorrhage classes, we see an increase in um, classification performance. And actually, um, you know, there's some decrease in the uh, normal case, but, you know, obviously within medical applications, I think we'd rather be a little more sensitive to the um, disease class than the normal. So I think we can get away with that. From there, um, <clears throat> we can show all of these cases, these are real cases in which traditional augmentation techniques misclassified um, these as subdural images, even though they're actually epidural images. And in the conditional generation images, um, GANs, I should say, uh, they actually correctly identified these as epidural. Um, I can't really tell you why um, it is. I think the speculation that we had was, you know, the locations or maybe the overall shape of the skull um, is more telling um, maybe uh, subdural and epidural cases are actually <clears throat> in a presentation wise very similar. So that might be one of the reasons why, but you know, at least the numbers show that our condition with GANS generation uh, improved these. Um, these are some of the failure modes. So these are the real image inputs. These is a uh, vanishing gradient. So again, <clears throat> the generator is not strong. The discriminator is too strong that it just generates random noise. And then there's the um, mode collapse in a sense where it's kind of focused on just the skull only and doesn't really focus on the soft tissue of the uh, brain. So it kind of focuses on one part of the, the image then more so than the others. Finally, uh, <clears throat> this was actually generated from our rebuttal um, <clears throat> to their reviewer because the reviewer was asking us, and I'm sure you've thought of this during this talk as well, how can we tell um, these images are good, right? Sure, we can show <clears throat> a ton of images to radiologists and try to fool them and all of that stuff. And we could say, oh yeah, it's really good, really bad, whatever. And we could say maybe, oh, because we don't see like the actual fissures of the brain or the ventricles of the brain, it's not good. But at least our results are saying, you know, 
although it doesn't have the you know soft tissue uh, aspects of the brain, it actually improves our performance at least in the multi-class level. So how do we explain quote unquote the quality of the brain, right? Or I guess the synthetic images. So what we did in a somewhat clever way is we know in the GANs, we have a discriminator. The discriminator is going to try and figure out is the input image real or fake? And it's gonna assign a score, right? It's going to be, if it's real, it's going to be one. If it's fake, it's going to be zero. And for the test set, I just calculated the actual discriminator scores for all of the epidural and the uh, hemorrhage classes as well as the normal class. So these are the scores and the standard deviations. <clears throat> And when we see these, we see that, oh, hey, um, there's no significant difference between these two. I mean, yes, it looks like there's a difference between the means and the standard deviations, but we actually performed a T-test of significance, and we saw that there's no difference between any of the hemorrhage classes. So essentially what that's saying is the discriminator is saying, hey, there's no huge difference between uh, the real and the fake images at least in their eyes, except for the normal, which honestly, there, I feel like there isn't a huge difference if you look at just the means and the standard deviations. But you know, the law of large numbers kind of says there's a significant difference. Okay, um, any questions so far? Because this is kind of gonna go into, um, I think what I think is going to be an interesting uh, area of research for GANs. Mainly I had two. Uh, mm -hmm. So I might leave in a bit, but I did have two. So the first one was going back to cyclogans. Are there any restrictions on on the two types of images that sort of you transform back to one another? Like, so can you, is it only like horses and horses and zebras are somewhat similar? Dogs and cats might be somewhat similar. Oranges and apples might be somewhat similar. But do you, so like, can you do something from like, just as a wacko project, like uh, just from horses to apples or something like that? Like, is there a, is there a place, is there like a point where? Yeah. Right. Um, I think that'd be very interesting. Um, and I guess maybe the closest uh, sample that I have for you is kind of this aspect, right? So I think I showed um, here, Mm -hmm. that translating from the single energy to 50 kV and mm -hmm. the VUE, right? Mm -hmm. uh, virtually unenhanced. It was kind of going from Hansfeld units to Hansfeld units. So at least it was like in what, um, I guess in the late terms, maybe kind of going from animal to animal or mm -hmm. uh, fruit to fruit, right? <clears throat> this iodine one was tricky because again, cyclogans did not learn that well in iodine. So it was almost kind of going from uh, I don't know, fruits to vegetables, which, you know, they're still similar, they're still plants, but I guess there's a, a, a shift in distributions, or I guess, uh, I don't want to say modality, but differences, right? Yeah. Because you're really going from sort of a value of electron density to a density of the molecular content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, technically you can, because we see in picks to picks, and I'm sure if I tried to train the cyclogans in a smarter way now, um, from what I know now, I'm sure it could have happened. But uh, for cyclogans, it is very difficult because, um, again, the Hansfeld unit ranges normally go from negative 2000 to 2000, right? Um, iodine, actually, the units were much smaller. Mm -hmm. um, I think like orders of 10 or 100 magnitude smaller, at least the intensity ranges. And you could actually see from the images itself, like these two images, I could kind of tell it's like CT, or I guess it looks similar, but this one is very, very different, or, or sorry, iodine, I guess, is very different from the other two, right? Um, at least like you can see the background in a sense is what I'm saying. Um, <clears throat> so that's why it's possible. Uh, It'd be interesting to see if you wanted to go from a zebra to an apple and an apple to a zebra. Uh, 
I'm not exactly sure what that would give us. Maybe maybe you could try the experiment, Shima. And then, so the other part I wanted to talk touch on was when would you not want to use Gantt? Or, because we've talked about like mm -hmm. a lot of applications of Gantt, so like when would you not want to use Gantt? Okay. Um, I was gonna say, you might be asking the wrong person because I kind of want to use Gantt on everything, but uh, <laughs> I would say, um, well, so I guess let me ask you uh, okay. maybe a clarification mm -hmm. question. Of, so yeah. like, mainly one big application of GAMS, at least I see, is to build up your training data set or mm -hmm. items of such. So for me, when would you not want to use that? Or when would that not be sort of like a, a good approach? <clears throat> right. And actually, I think that actually translates pretty well to my next topic of like kind of the futures of GANs. Uh -huh. So you know how I said, okay, so there's, you know, real data, right? Real data is has rich and cheap data. So <clears throat> I'm sure, you know, if we all saw some chest x-rays and then, you know, uh, if we just saw like normal images um, and then really, really bad cases, right? Like there's like a giant hole in the chest, anybody, can probably figure out, hey, there's something wrong here, right? Um, so that's kind of cheap data. So in this side, you can kind of see, <clears throat> at least in the center of the distribution, which is kind of far from the hard cases in a sense, we could say, oh yeah, this is totally a one or this is totally a two or whatever, right? But there are cases in the middle or between the distributions or I guess um, the decision boundaries that are very difficult. So, you know, let's just say a bad uh, person's bad handwriting. Like you could say, you know, that kind of looks like a one with like the, you know, uh, I guess a one with like dashes like this. I could see it be being a one. It could be a two that's like a little weird. Like this could be a one. So, you know, it's, it's the, the rich information that is going to be valuable for the classifier, right? Um, <clears throat> so in that sense, I would say you don't want to use GANs um, that is super general, I would say, for augmentation because, um, you know, if you have this three-class sample and you're just generating anything that's real, you can't really say, okay, generate more of the blues because we're kind of missing that, right? So in that application, it's bad. But in a very wide level, you don't want to use GANs um, to generate uh, cheap data. You want to generate rich data. Does that kind of make sense? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Okay. <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, and again, to be fair, um, I think there's applications for sure in which you kind of want real data. Oh, actually, here's the, I, I guess this was a better answer. You don't want to use GANs on any of your testing sets. Um, for training, sure, go ahead, right? You can do any sort of augmentation, any sort of whatever. But obviously, if you want to see the real performance, you have to test it on real data. Um, you can't just say, hey, here's this GAN-generated realistic data. Let's see how our classification performs here. That is not a good idea. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, I kind of going through that same train of thought. We want GANs to generate rich data. And like as I mentioned before, GANs in general is only going to generate at a normal distribution from the center of the whatever condition or whatever um, model there is, right? From the real distribution that it knows. So it's not really, I mean, it will generate some images near the boundary, but it won't actively seek it out in a sense. It'll mostly generate realistic ones because again, you can get as a discriminator in, I guess, the whole architecture, you're gonna get some negative feedback if you generate ones here because it doesn't look as real as the ones in the center, right? So there's now kind of a, I think, a, I think, and this is, you know, my research. Um, well, this isn't my specific research, but my research is in trying to generate realistic or I guess richer data, right? And one of the neat 
uh, architectures that I've seen, at least in my review, was <clears throat> this sort of fence scan. So fence scan is mostly for uh, anomaly detection. And what it's kind of doing is, quote unquote, fencing off the real data with fake data so that you can detect anomalies way better. So essentially, the red is the real data, blue is the fake data. And over time, the fence scan is trying to slowly fence the real data in so that the anomaly detection is good. So blue is saying it's anomaly, red is saying it's a uh, uh, real or not, or in distribution in a sense. So you can see in this case, like it thinks everything is real, right? And eventually it'll learn that, oh, if it's outside the real distribution, it's anomalous, it's not real. Now, how they do that is through kind of like the two um, things, well, I guess three, three losses that they calculate, which um, I'm sure um, would, I'm sure Anant would like is, <clears throat> In the original Gansi, you can see that, oh, it just generates realistic samples. You can't really tell what's anomalous, what's not. However, um, there's, they add this like dispersion loss. So what the dispersion loss is saying is, okay, in this blue sample, we have this, let's just say a center of mass or sort of a center of the generated samples like here, right? Oh, that's a bad color. Uh, Let's say blue. So center of mass right there. Well, the dispersion loss is saying, don't get close to the center, like go away from the center. And so what it does is um, it helps kind of reduce this mode collapse thing. And so it helps kind of spread the, the gener uh, generated images outside. The encirclement loss is kind of saying, okay, make sure it's around the boundary <clears throat> and it's near this decision boundary that it sees here, right here. And then weighted loss is saying, okay, make sure uh, the real real is real more so than the fake reels essentially. And so with those, you actually get a very good um, uh, anomaly detection method. Uh, there's decision boundary GANs. Um, Essentially, what it does is is essentially knowledge distillation. So you have this, you know, super high level, uh, very very deep model that has very good classification accuracies, but maybe you want to, you want a lighter model, right? Um, that is hopefully as good. So what it does is use a GANs to generate images near the decision boundaries of the teacher. Essentially, generate you know richer data according to the teacher and use that um, reinforced or I guess richer data set that's augmented to this uh, and input that to the student and then eventually um, the student learns pretty well and about as good as the teacher. So that's one way to kind of distill the knowledge by augmenting richer data. Um, and then there's this uh, boundary conditional GANs so again, they use a, an AC GANs architecture to kind of make it more uniform. And they see like, oh, how? Um, <clears throat> essentially what they did for this paper was they wanted to protect against um, uh, adversarial attacks. And so essentially this is regular GANs, right? So it's trying to generate uh, the realistic images and these are two separate classes and it's only generating one of the classes. However, with this AC GAN feedback loop, because this condition is trying to re, or sorry, right here, it's trying to re uh, identify the class that it's trying to um, classify. What the AC GAN, or I guess what this boundary conditional GANs is doing is they added this B loss in which they try to um, penalize the discriminator for uh, identifying classes well. What it's trying to do is in this two class problem, it's trying to force the class discrimination to um, <clears throat> output 50-50, essentially. So generate images near this boundary is what they're trying to do. And so if you have this B2, 
um, it's, it's just like a, um, I guess, regularization function or not function. It's a multiplication of the, the loss that is being put to this class identification. And the more you have, the more it's going to generate images near this boundary. And eventually the generated images becomes a shield against adversarial attacks. And those are kind of like the three ways. Um, obviously there's a lot more, um, how to calculate the losses, like um, identifying multiple uh, classes of these boundaries, uh, you know, embeddings and all that stuff. And then I think, uh, I won't go too into it, but I know Zach and I have some discussions about is GANs like really safe or secure because in federated learning aspects, you know, although technically you're not uploading data, you're uploading really like weights and maybe updates to the model. There's, you know, some ways, or I guess theorized ways in which you could get back to the real data. And so um, I think GANs is probably safe or at least quote unquote safer, um, at least in some circles that they say, but it's kind of a, a semantic thing, I think, um, how you want to slice it in a sense. And um, that's kind of it. I guess, thank you all for uh, listening to this long talk about GANs. Um, okay, Toby, what are my thoughts about GANs for image registration? Um, I could kind of see it because um, <clears throat> it would almost be uh, two condition uh, images, right? So you would, Essentially, it would be like image translation with a, I guess, target condition. Um, however, <clears throat> I'm not sure if that's ideal because one, um, the target image is not like it's a change of, um, I guess, tissue density or I guess the information of the pixels. It's actually like moving the image, right? Um, so if you go back to like uh, all the way back to those horse images and stuff. Uh, yeah, like the actual positions of the horse doesn't move, right? Like the content or I guess the visuals of the um, horse or zebra changes, but it doesn't uh, <clears throat> change the shape or the image of the uh, output. Um, same here, you can see that this really doesn't change, right? Um, so I think image registration wise, I think uh, the target has too wide of a distribution in a sense. Um, because again, it's, it's, it's almost like kind of um, working against the moving target, I feel like. So I'm not sure if that's ideal, but um, it'd be interesting to see for sure. But yeah, I mean, with that, I think- Any other, any yeah. other questions? This was amazing. Okay, I have, okay, awesome. um, I have some comments. Okay. So um, I really liked, okay. Uh, maybe one question, then I'll stop recording. Mm -hmm. We have some earlier students who are just getting into this space, right? So if we right. remember, this was you a few, uh, a few more than a year ago, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So how would you recommend for, you know, for the newer people to get started if this is like something that they wanna okay. uh, do? Mm -hmm. um, I think one, there's a big emphasis on kind of uh, lit reviews, right? Um, Obviously, if you want to get into something, you should definitely read about as much as you can. Uh, uh, I think you should, I mean, read a lot more about it. And I think for sure, um, starting that, uh, starting with the GAN review paper was definitely helpful because it showed one, uh, it, it exposed me to a lot of architectures that I didn't know of at the start. And two, it showed me a lot of applications and sort of the adjustments that each authors had to do 
for those applications um, that kind of, uh, I guess, showed the nuances that could go into training again. Um, otherwise, I would say actually running these models, especially on even like toy data sets is very important um, because, you know, <clears throat> at a very high level, and I'm encountering this as well. Um, I think, you know, working with toy data sets, or I guess at a higher level, I could tell you, oh yeah, you know, you should use this loss function and it makes sense to use dice score and MSE or, you know, all of this stuff. But until you actually use a um, actual model and actual like loss functions and try to train it yourself, I don't think you will understand because for me, um, for this um, image translation method, during the training, it looked pretty good. Um, like you can see cycle gains here, like it's still generating iodine images very well. But a lot of the problems that we encountered was that um, one, the obviously CT images are going to always, and any, and any images has to say, are going to have a lot of intensity variations. And unfortunately, when you do normalization of that, so, uh, like certain peaks or I guess certain spikes within the image is going to make the image like normalize significantly differently. And if you have a huge variation in input and output and target for your GANs, uh, it's going to have a struggle. So for this paper, actually, for this set of experiments, we actually windowed um, a lot of these CTs to a uh, acceptable range. So we didn't go from negative 2000 to 2000. We actually went from, uh, well, for the KVs, the 50 and the VUE, we went from negative 500 to 1500. And then for iodine, we actually went from negative 250 to 500. So that we knew that for most of the images, um, the intensity ranges are going to be saturated and there isn't a huge variation of these normalizations. Um, so I would say uh, learn about the architectures, but also like try to put it uh, in, put it uh, into practice because I know for like some of the topics that I'm trying to do with like this decision and stuff, again, I wanna generate richer images and I tried to implement something like this, but um, this beta factor and the, this lot, KL divergence losses, it's not working as, as I expected, you know? I was thinking, oh yeah, you know, this is very simple. You just add a beta, you add a KL divergence to this AC GANs. And they made it seem like very simple, but um, trying it out with like these toy data sets, especially with multi labels, because again, they only did a binary label case, right? But what if there's three classes? Um, if there's three classes, like if there's a boundary like this, like where is the generation going to be? Is it going to only generate here? Because it's trying to generate 50-50, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, you kind of want some things here, some things here, and some things here. So how do we account for that? And I think that's uh, the difficulty in a sense of, I guess, trying to test things and, you know, uh, try it out yourself, I guess. Cool. Okay. Um, so, okay, I'll, I'll pause, then I'll give you some 